Hello everyone, welcome to the NPTEL course on remote sensing and GIS for rural development. This is week 11, lecture 2. We are coming close to the end of this wonderful lecture series where I have been getting a lot of comments on how easy it is to use remote sensing for applications for rural development. And as I said earlier, I've met a lot of people who have expressed their interest in this course and multiple other ways that could be used for collecting data and working on rural development. On this note, I have also looked into certain aspects that are new for rural development and we'll be discussing this in the current lecture series. So while we are on the penultimate week, week 11, I will also showcase one aspect of data collection that is less acknowledged and less used um, at the real world. However, wherever this methodology has been used has con created considerable impact. Of this, I'll be first talking about the synergized mapping. So let us go into this remote sensing and GIS for rural development, week 11, lecture two, where we will be looking at data from other sources that have been used for rural development. Let's say, for example, we have looked into this uh, pretty um, much in detail. What is synergized mapping is there are multiple players, multiple agencies that come in and help to map the data. And there are institutions and NGOs that create capacity training and update the knowledge of people through on the ground exercises and farmers, stakeholders, rural communities are those who actually engage with the data and the results because it is for them these data is collected and used. So we have looked at satellite and drone data, but now we're going to look at crowdsourcing plus satellite data in a synergized mapping scenario. In this scenario, what happens is a lot of data can come through. However, not all data can be in a usable format. It is because there could be some uh, data issues, uh, quality issues, what data is being collected is not clear. So we will look into a, a schematic uh, where actually this has been done at scale and a lot of people have been using this for the last past 10 years. So uh, of the crowdsourcing uh, data collection method, let me introduce what crowdsourcing means. So crowd is the general public and sourcing means you are sourcing the data from them. For that to happen, there has to be a platform that is given to the locals or crowd, we call it here. And they participate voluntarily. There's no payment here. Like for example, they have to give data and then they get money or it is not a mandate for them. This is purely voluntarily done. So what we have here is uh, a group of people who are cautious about the system, what they're monitoring and they collect data and upload it or share it to the platform. So the platform has to be robust enough to capture the data and then put it at a larger scale. For example, uh, the farmers might give data on the crop growing scenario. Is it, is it at bud stage? Is it at uh, intermediate stage? Is it at fully grown stage? So these stages can be monitored and then given back to the crowdsourced platform. Let's say, for example, we have a database I've created uh, where we can put the data and then see if it triangulates with what is happening on the ground, like uh, other satellite data, like uh, rainfall, land surface temperature, NDVI, 
we can we can triangulate if the data is working and or if the government schemes are addressing these issues. For example, the Jal Jeevan mission is there where every uh, house in the village is to be connected through a tap. And also there is the grid scheme where uh, across uh, India, the rural electrification program has been well received. But the quality could be compromised because of other externalities. So the pipe might be there, but water coming in or not is very, very crucial. And that relies on the resources available. So how do we monitor it? We, it is very in, highly impossible to put meters everywhere and then monitor it, given the population we have. So the best way is to work ground up. So all the other data is top down, where we call it top down approach, where the government collects data through the system and then takes it back to the top and then analyzes it for policy. When you talk of bottom up, the people, the crowd who is at the key stakeholder level, they will collect data and then put it up in the system. So how is that useful? This is useful because the data goes from the user's end. For example, I am drinking this water, so I should be able to know what is the quality of the water because is it affecting me healthy, etc rather than trusting the supplier who's giving me the water, right? So this, at the supply end, there could be a data collected from the tap, how the water is coming, the quality. But at the end user, how is the water quality I should be able to give? And this helps in intermediate issues that can happen in the water supply. There could be leakages, there could be mixing of dirty water and drinking water, etc. So all these can be done if the end user gives the data. So census is an end user data, right? You don't monitor from the top. People go door by door, collect the number of people uh, living, number of households, and then issue the data. And from there, the electoral uh, data is created. And from there, your, your uh, population is also assessed. These are important scenarios for any government to develop, both urban and rural. But very much it is important in the rural entity because at the rural level, what happens is we have to have clarity on the data. We need to have better infrastructures planned and for which you have a lot of data that is needed. In the cities, it is almost easy to collect because the representativeness is there. There's a community of uh, houses. So one house reflects all the other houses. Whereas rural, it's not. It's very, very scattered. Uh, and uh, hamlets are there where a group of 30 to 20 houses will be there. And then suddenly after that, there's, there's a big land of agricultural land and then another 20 houses, 30 houses, 10 houses, etc. So to address this, the best way is to go bottom up where crowdsourcing is key. Uh, and I've been advocating this a, a lot because if you use open source software, open source instruments, uh, then you could definitely collect data at a very, very high spatial and temporal resolution in rural villages for the fraction of the cost. For example, the farmers can take just an image. They don't have to use an app to take an image. Already the camera is there in the smartphone. And almost 90% of people have um, uh, smartphones if they can afford it. Like economically um, along the average line, there are multiple phones now available, which um, are not that too costly and does the job. So one quick um, check of the fact is that you do see a lot of uh, TikTok videos and uh, Instagrams, Facebook videos, YouTube videos from villages and all of that using smartphones. You don't have to have fancy devices. So moving on, uh, there is potential to collect data and put it. Uh, so now why don't we use this for geospatial location data, GIS data is the key. And this is what a company has been working on and looking at this data in a long-term fashion. Let us look at this in a uh, app that has been created in, in recent times. So OpenStreetMap has been widely used. It is a very, very sophisticated system. Uh, we will discuss this system in today's lecture and also download the plugin um, uh, in the QGIS software. 
uh, and see how it works and reflects the data. So I would like to install the plugin in the current series, uh, and then we will take a call on how uh, this map works. So what we have here is OpenStreetMap is a tool that everyone uh, uses for uh, looking at uh, certain data that has been collected and shared by public. So what is OSM? It was found by uh, Steve Coast in 2009. It is a free open geographic database. It has data attributes, we call them, right? So uh, some data about um, whatever locations, uh, amenities, schools, uh, crops, everything, okay? Uh, you'll be amazed to see the quality of the data. Uh, not all data is there because this is not run by a organization to collect data. It is free open source volunteer data. So only if people pitch in data, you will get data. So uh, let us look at this at a very uh, close angle. Uh, my point here is when I say that all area is not covered, uh, the point I'm trying to make is uh, most of the data is covered and we'll be able to use it um, wisely if we know that most of the data is covered. So starting with no data, at least we have a data that can be used. That is the question. Uh, so we will be able to uh, look at in the next lecture, um, a particular uh, state and a particular district. We will download the uh, map uh, and then we'll apply it in this uh, OSM software um, uh, app. We'll, we'll install this plugin in QGIS and then we'll extract data. So this is based on community of volunteers, this data collection. Uh, initially, it was very small in 2009 uh, when Steve Coast had started it, but slowly the momentum grows. So the, like any other company, any other product, uh, it starts slow, but then when people momentum start, a lot of data comes in. The data quality could be an issue. I will open this link uh, pretty soon now. Uh, and uh, it is freely licensed. But again, let's not talk about the negatives uh, right away. There's a lot and a lot of positives. Uh, uh, I would say that this is one of the highest updated data uh, that any government would like to use uh, because it comes from the bottom, not from the top, where top down is you will send a, a person to go collect data. So he or she will travel, go collect data, and then come back, sit and map, it takes time. Whereas here, with the click of a button from the volunteer, it comes straight to the uh, location uh, database and the volunteer is already sitting in the village. So you don't need to have, um, you know, super um, uh, time taken for these kind of activities. So let us uh, open the free open street uh, map.org. Uh, and um, what we'll be looking at is We'll be looking at the data set, the metadata about the data, as I usually am telling you that it is very, very important to have uh, metadata for all the data products that we have. Uh, the boundaries may not be correct because they may use different boundaries, uh, but we are, going, we are more important uh, and we are more focused on the attributes. Okay, so uh, let me uh, quickly open it. Um, and while uh, we go to the website, this is the uh, OSM plugin that uh, I'd like you to install. Uh, I hope you know how to install it because we have given you the tutorials on installing plugins. Uh, however, if there is uh, time enough, we could also show quickly how to install the quick OSM. So I will go back to this opening this uh, links. Uh, please allow me to share. Right. So this is the first link uh, when we open openstreetmap.org. Uh, you have uh, the map uh, coming up. Uh, you can search a location. So let's say you can search Pune as we have been doing uh, for the past uh, lecture series. Yes, I would like to see the Pune and there's multiple other things in Pune, but let's go here. Okay, so you, here you have the boundaries also. So fixed admin boundary for Kalyani Nagar, fixed boundary for Pune. These are the data that are there uh, in different languages also you can have. Uh, and um, um, in Tamil also it is showing. Um, so there are different, different languages and parts available. 
Okay, so this is the one uh, when you when you open Google and then search for OpenStreetMaps, most probably this will come up uh, because this is uh, uh, the basics. You can say learn more and then see uh, where it goes in terms of uh, who's the local knowledge uh, and then how the community is driven. But I would like to see here, show you here, it is hosted and supported by UCL. Uh, UCL is uh, the um, London's global university homepage. Um, so uh, it is it is actually pretty good that a university is giving these spaces because someone would have asked me, okay, how how do you get uh, a big a big database and managing the database? All of that is done in this UCL, um, which is good because some some these cannot be uh, uh, by itself. Um, done. So UCL stands for University College London uh, and uh, a lot of research activities have been done here. Uh, you could see that uh, the the uh, database it's, it stores is pretty uh, historic and it will it will actually do a wonders uh, because um, they cannot afford to do it. As a volunteering company you cannot afford to do all of it. right? So and also this is supported by Fastly, Bitmark Hosting, and other partners. Bitmark Hosting is also a cloud uh, space, but other partners are also there. So let's first acknowledge all the partners uh, from the many support. I've been supporting OpenStreetMap from the beginning at the Barlet Center. I'm very very grateful. Barlet Center is the uh, hopefully the data center that um, creates all these uh, locations. Our built environment is is uh, having some. Um, data input and data access. Fastly, Bitemark, uh, for many years, have been extremely helpful uh, for uh, uh, supporting them and many, many others. Many, many others are here. You'll see mostly, you don't see the proprietary software here uh, because uh, for them, this is kind of um, uh, not, uh, they're just cutting in their business and profit, right? So proprietary software have always business these, whereas this is open source, it is free for everyone to use. You can learn more about OpenStreetMap. So let's go quickly and learn more. Um, so you, you see the local knowledge. Uh, what does the local know about the, a particular data set? Let's say water body. Uh, what is the name of the water body? Everything is, is contributed. Uh, contributors use aerial imagery, GPS, and low tech field maps to verify OSM is accurate and up to date. Uh, so for example, OSM might contact you after you give data to show that this image we have taken, can you check if this image is correct? Let's say the Poe Lake boundary. Uh, we know that the Poe Lake boundary has been changing because of the um, uh, developments around the lake. Uh, so they'll ask me, okay, is it correct? Is it changing? And then those kind of things we can take on aerial imagery. Uh, then we have the GPS devices. Uh, some people may not have a handheld GPS device to monitor and take data. However, your phones are pretty good. Your phones can take a very good amount of data. So please try to see if you could use your phones um, for uh, these kind of um, data collection and stuff. There are multiple apps for GPS. Uh, please look into uh, your Play Store, Apple, uh, store for um, downloading uh, accurate GPS free open source software that gives you the location and in the location you can mark um, school, education, um, crop type, anything that you can mark. Low field tech maps, uh, so some maps that needs to be updated and then those are being used and it is community driven. Uh, a lot of uh, passionate um, uh, youngsters uh, are, are giving a lot of their time to develop this database. Um, and then they're very, who are they? They are very uh, fond of mapping GIS professionals, engineers, humanitarians, uh, disaster relief workers, NGOs, industries, colleges, institutes, etc. And open sea street uh, uh, maps are free data. OSM is free open data. They are free to use for any purpose as long as you credit the open uh, street map and its contributors. I have, I don't, I don't see them pull you down. Uh, but uh, as I said, it is it is ethical to um, uh, thank the contributors and acknowledge them. So please uh, feel free um, uh, and take it as a as a duty to acknowledge them when you use their data. So you see that all my my um, slides when I'm using OSM, I do have their logos. So the logo is meaning of uh, not showing that it is my work; it is OSM work. Okay, so the copyright and, and uh, open data statement tells that it is uh, 
free and open for everyone to use. So this is very important because a lot of people give money for them, right? So as a as a free open source system, uh, they cannot sustain by themselves. A lot of people have put in money. When they put in money, they want it to be not commercialized, but available for the people. Uh, if they start commercializing, then it becomes a company. And I, I demand a share on the profit, right? So if I'm putting money uh, and they are using for commercial, then I demand money for my services and, and budget. But here, since it is um, a full open source, pura open source, it is, it is important to understand that there is a need for acknowledging them and it has to be kept open source. Okay, so legal documents are there if you would like to see. Uh, and then these are the partners, hosting partners. Again, UCL, as I said, hosts the data, a part of the data. It's better to break it into smaller bins and then store it. Let's say Asia region is in one, one database, uh, the US region is in one database, etc. or some attributes. So they'll say all the schools are in one location, all the hospitals are in another location, etc. So the key contributors, if you to see, you would see multiple countries. You don't see India yet. Maybe it's not picking up yet. Uh, so hopefully it will pick up. Uh, and then there are trademarks for the brand. Oh, awesome as a brand has been trademarked. Okay, so in the open street communities, if you go to the community part, uh, okay, I'll, I'll go back to what is open street uh, maps. We've learned a lot. So you can see the history of your um, uh, your searching and and um, um, how people have updated. As I said, uh, in this location, who's updating? So if I change the location and then uh, go to let's say Chennai, uh, and then okay, so Chennai is there nine months ago. Someone. Uh, has uh, input some some data uh, and then you can go to see the history uh, in the history also you can see now the name changes for so for this region so the box you see for the box who has input data and how how uh, old so closed about 11 hours ago someone has input a data on accessibility uh, added elementary uh, etymology data added buildings uh, so you can click here and see what buildings were, were added. So someone added this building in OpenStreetMap, which is really good. Uh, and other nodes, locations, et cetera, can be taken up. Right. So in the history side, we do see a lot of these data. Two, two um, three days ago, three days ago, and um, somewhere your name and other uh, uh, stuff is being added uh, because they say how many edits, map notes, etc. So here is where sometimes you may not um, get uh, very, very accurate data, but it is your uh, role as a researcher, as a student to make sure you verify the data uh, because it's open source. People can put um, data that is not correct and accurate. And that is not purposely done. It is done also because uh, maybe they didn't know the correct way of doing it. So it is up to you to uh, correctly map. So when you start mapping, you'll have to sign up, uh, display name, your profile, and then you can create the maps where you want to put data and other sources. So this is it about uh, OpenStreetMaps. Uh, you have GPS traces where um, it tells you uh, someone has traced a route uh, from drag point, uh, Toyota price from a car, uh, and then uh, a lot of other people have done traces using their GPS uh, data. So basically they have taken the GPS um, location and road and path, and they're putting it into it. So user diaries are um, about users and how they have mapped, how it has helped, etc. hospitals, locations, if you see this, it is mostly uh, very, very useful in uh, developing and underdeveloped nations uh, because you don't have a uh, set agency like NASA or ESA for helping them using remote sensing data. So crowdsourcing is the way forward. And then we have the communities, as we said, we already saw the communities, uh, multiple open street communities. We don't have one for India yet. Uh, and I really hope, um, a lot of communities can be set up and users can, uh, like you who are taking this class, can also be part of this community. And then copyright, yes, there is a lot of uh, copyright um, uh, that can be shared. 
uh, and uh, use. So we can see this. I've already said uh, what are the copyrights um, that are available for public. Uh, you can you can pick and choose uh, your copyright status depending on how you use the map and for what you use it. The trademark is there. The magnifying glass logo and the state map are registered trademarks of Open Street Foundation. We will not go into the Open Street Foundation, but understand that uh, it is part of the logo and trademark. Okay, so uh, we will now go into the other uh, aspect. Uh, let me um, where we have the help uh, section where we can see like beginner's guide, help for a mailing list. You can be part of the community. Uh, you can open the Open Street uh, Map Wiki uh, to look at um, documentation about the uh, OSM. So you can see here the beginner's guide, developers and users platform, etc. So this gets back to your uh, browsing the Open Street Maps. How to browse? What are these low points? So it's like a tutorial for you to use. Uh, and then uh, use it for your learning and understand. We'll do some quick tutorials. Uh, I believe in doing it and learning it. So it's better to do that way uh, also, okay? Good. So we have uh, come here uh, and then uh, we also have other uh, platforms, forums, uh, asking questions. So, so normally, as I said, there is a lot of uh, open source community uh, helps where people just help you to do it. So for example here, show coordinates on map, download inter international boundaries. So maybe someone has an issue in downloading. Completely new with OSM, I try to download all international boundaries. Is that possible? And yes, how? And then the answer is given uh, soon. So yet the answer is not given because it's a very recent question. Uh, let's go to some questions. The answer is there. Routing distance from open street map. Uh, so someone is asking, I use OSRM backed API to regulate routing waypoints, uh, but they have a user image. What should I do? You can set up the gra graph hopper or OSRM on your infrastructures, then load the PBF file for calculating uh, the uh, distance. Okay. But the point here is um, so basically, any question is you have, uh, if it is a legit question and a serious question, they will be answering it. Uh, because people take their time looking at it and answering it. So uh, let me, uh, while we, before we go to the uh, next session, uh, I would like to um, open uh, the uh, plugin and then show you how to uh, download uh, your, uh, your plugins, uh, because that is very important at this stage, uh, for which uh, you will have to you have to make sure you know that uh, is it useful uh, and uh, do you have the uh, bandwidth for keeping keeping the stored data in your computer okay so with this uh, let me uh, open my qgis uh, page so let it let it open in the background i'm going to open my qgis uh, while we go back to the uh, previous slide and then Open this link. Okay. So we will also look at the files, the metadata as promised. Let me open. So which is here in the web in the page, bottom uh, right. Uh, I'm going to open the. Um, the planet OSM, uh, which is the metadata. Uh, download spaces are currently restricted. So you can download the data. So here's where you can learn about the data and download the data. So latest uh, torrent file on um, uh, data that has existed, 125 GB created two, uh, two days ago, uh, latest weekly change sets, uh, all in a torrent site, you'll have to use torrent to um, download it. Uh, and again, this is if you want to download the entire data. But I'll be showing you without this how to download the data uh, as a QGIS package. So for that, uh, let me open my QGIS and share with you. So, okay. So I'm going to share my QGIS. Yes, we have my QGIS. Uh, and um, yes, 
Let me share my QGIS. Uh, so what you see here is an empty slide. Uh, I'm going to go to plugin, manage and install plugins. It will first open that pop-up which says I'm going to download the repository, let it download, uh, and then this happens. So in the installed, I have all these installed uh, for my previous um, maps. Now I'm going to type Q quick OSM. Okay, so quick OSM is the uh, tool that we'll be using. So let's first read about it here. Okay, so it says download OSM data thanks to the overpass API. You can also open local uh, OSM or a PDF file. This is also the logo trademark by them uh, uh, in terms of uh, using it for data. Uh, parser top OGR is used to let you see all the OSM keys. 250 ratings, look at the number of downloads, uh, literally a lot of downloads. Um, and then the tags are OpenStreetMaps, et cetera. So OpenStreetMap is what we want. Uh, we will click it, and then once this happens, we say install plugin, let it install, depending on your internet speed and internet bandwidth, it will take some time. Okay, so now it has done. So quickly, this will get updated, just see it. Okay, here is what happens. Uh, plugin installed successfully, and we have the QSM page that we have. Uh, so it says the version. So initially these were not there. Now it says 2.1.1 updated August 21. Um, and these are the versions, uh, add a warning key, what, how this is improved than this. So we had 2.01, 2.10, 2.1.1. Uh, we're going to use the uh, recent one. So this is about learning on uh, what are the issues in the previous and how they fix it. Fix an issue with installing Q quick QSM plugin, good, and then we'll close it. So now if you go to vectors and then say, see the vector tools, you'll see QSM, okay? Uh, do not open this now, we don't want that, but uh, QSM is what we'll be using for our uh, lecture in the next um, uh, lecture. Because right now, let us set it up. Um, and I also wanted to show you something that is needed for uh, collecting data quickly from OSM. So I, I'm going to add uh, my uh, India layer. So we'll go here in my GIS layers we have. So I already have some data that is uh, downloaded uh, for this class, but I also want you to um, download some data that uh, is very important for you. Let's say you're going to download uh, a particular uh, database uh, which is which is having a lot of information on your project so let's say you're going to do a rural project in uh, uh, india tamil nadu and within that a particular district so how do you go about it is the question so here we will we will look into um, uh, a particular database uh, and then uh, we'll see if um, how how we could download the data, use it in, in the uh, following uh, ways, okay? So uh, I'm going to now download, uh, uh, first uh, attach my district uh, and full states. I'm gonna show you quickly how to uh, take data. So this data was taken from um, a previous geological, uh, the Survey of India data, okay, the previous version, because I, I was doing something previous before the Andhra Telangana was divided okay so you could see that the full andhra is there uh, uh, so this this was used for my particular research interest um, and then you also have vector data you can add more vector data click on what else data i have uh, you have india district shape file uh, okay i'll add india district shape file add um, and then you'll see the whole of india with my districts Okay, so let's say I need a particular district. I have a particular district in mind uh, that I would like to use for my analysis. So I'm just going to open my attribute table. You can search for it using the search uh, box, uh, or you can actually, if you know the district name, uh, you can come down uh, and then look at it. So this is the name zero is the India level. Then you have the state level, uh, and then you have the district name in here. So let's first uh, click the button here. So once you um, click the uh, open attribute table, I think my open attribute table is not visible because of my screen. So I hope now it is visible. Yes. 
So all I've done is I've opened the India districts uh, file uh, and then the open uh, attribute table has come. I have clicked the name zero is India, name one is state, and then name two is your district. So I clicked this uh, arrow mark so that it um, does it into alphabetical order. Let me do it again uh, just to show you how to do it. I'm moving the layer. I am adding a vector layer. Okay, now the vector layer has been added. I'm going to open the open attribute table. Okay, so this is a name, a state name, zero is India country name, and then the uh, uh, district name is name two. So you can see that randomly it has been arranged. Let me click that button and then it goes uh, up. So now I want P, so I'll, I'll let me uh, come down to Tricha Pali because that is what I am going to use uh, for my uh, study. ST. Okay, so we have Tenu, Tanjavur, uh, starting from here, Sri Rangam, um, Tutukudi, Tiruvallur. So we can just come down um, uh, to see uh, which districts that we want to use. So Trichrapali is what? So right here, I'm going to click it. So that whole line is being selected. So now if you come down uh, and then see the, the district has been selected, correct? So all you have to do is right click, export, export uh, save feature as in this page, make sure this is clicked, save only selected features because you have clicked a entire district uh, shape file. We're not going to do the entire district. We're only going to do a particular uh, district. So I'm extracting it, it's kind of extracting. So I'm going to say that I'm going to save it as Trichy, the short form of Trichrapali. So I'm going to save, and then the default, other things are default can be uh, saved. Add save file onto it, yes. So now if I remove the India district, so you still have Trichy, okay? So the idea is you can take a whole data set and from there, just extract what you want and keep it ready for your analysis in the next class. Uh, so OSM does require this aspect, uh, a shapefile to feed in, or you can uh, use your internet and then use OSM to have uh, good data extraction. So with this, I will stop here. I'll see you in the next class. Please be prepared with the OSM uh, plugin and also um, some shapefiles of your interest. Thank you.